Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, just be able to speak here to all of you. And uh, uh, I haven't been to Canada in quite a while, and so it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, I think it's a, a very important group of people to speak to, and the Jamestown Foundation uh, is very unique in the sense that uh, we have uh, an outreach in terms of our publications that reach uh, over 15,000 policymakers around the world. 50,000 people a month read our website. Uh, so we have a, um, a certain role to play in the community in educating people about the importance uh, of Ukraine and other parts of the former Soviet Union and, and, um, and as well as in the whole Eurasian region. Um, what I want to talk about today um, is Ukraine is a state in defining its national security architecture. Um, and as a part of this, uh, I want to talk about the role of the diaspora in helping Ukraine to define those interests. Uh, I think that's important because uh, there are organizations like Jamestown. We don't call ourselves a think tank. We like to refer to ourselves as a research and analysis organization. Um, but we're always constantly trying to put people together and also try to educate people as a part of the, in the policymaking community about that process. Uh, the third part of what I want to talk about also is how NGOs uh, like Jamestown and, and the organizations in the Ukraine diaspora can help Ukraine in overcoming uh, the problems that it has experienced in many aspects of its national security problems. I, I would like to say today, to quote, quote a term from the U.S. Navy, you as the diaspora are the tip of the spear. And what you can do as an organization and, and people and individuals uh, with your financial contributions, you can really help Ukraine make a difference. We've seen that with the role in Donbass and helping assist with many of the programs that you did, uh, providing many non-lethal items of, um, of assistance for Ukrainian soldiers. Um, but also the fourth element of what I want to talk today, about today is something very unique uh, and specific, and that's the role of the Ukrainian Navy. Uh, I'm something I'm kind of a, very close to. I've uh, been had a great deal of interest in the Ukrainian Navy after going uh, there this summer uh, and going to Odessa on a trip uh, with uh, uh, organized by Herman Kirshner's organization, American Foreign Policy Council. And that, that trip played a great role in terms of my own education and process of trying to understand uh, what, you know, the role of the Navy uh, and what its importance is for Ukraine. Ukraine is a maritime nation. You have 3,000 kilometers uh, of maritime seaboard. Uh, 85%, 80% of the Navy was destroyed during the, uh, the Russian invasion and annexation of Crimea. Uh, so there's been dev great devastation uh, within the Navy. The other aspect of that, uh, as affects the Navy, is also the idea of kind of, of how the Navy can play a role within society. Uh, and, and, and that takes me back to the first part of what I wanted to talk about Ukraine as a state and defining its national security architecture. Part of the problems that we have seen and experienced in Ukraine uh, is this great desire to uh, stop the Russian war in Donbass and the annexation, and that's involved the mobilization of a lot of resources. And what, my, what I've seen in my experience has been that Ukraine, for example, in 23 years of independence, never had a military exercise larger than 1,000 men. Uh, part of Ukraine's national security architecture, as you know, was shaped and rocked by many developments and corruption aspects of various of the different uh, governments and regimes that have emerged inside of Ukraine. And so part of that problem inside of Ukraine has really been, and especially in the last three years, has been trying to define what is the vision for the country and how can its bureaucracies inside Ukraine work and operate in a way that can defend the country. Now, in order to do that, you need an overall type of vision for the country and national security. But part of the problem has been what I've called uh, the hetmanization of Ukrainian national security policy. And by that, I mean uh, there are many different kind of warring clans and factions within Ukraine and between the Ministry of Defense, between Ukraine's uh, general staff, uh, between some of the NGOs, the battalions, uh, the National Guard, and, and you've seen all this. Of course, it's been a society being forged in the last three years by war and conflict. So it's just natural that as a part of that process that Ukraine has to try to develop this architecture, develop its ways and means in a way that it can defend itself. And part of that problem is, is and what I attribute is, is the greatest challenges to Ukraine are really organizational. And it's being able to implement it, the, implement the types of reforms that it needs to take 
as it aspires to get into NATO. Now, what I like to commonly say is that Ukraine, you can't get into become a member of NATO being led by former Soviet generals. And the problem in Ukraine is this vast bureaucratic network of generals uh, that are from the Soviet era that are still occupy many senior level positions and their great reluctance uh, to try to, to undertake reform. Now that's creating a lot of problems in many different areas. Now with this, um, and because of this, the Ukraine is now in this kind of constant gridlock inside internally trying to get things done. Now, and, and trying to implement its national objectives. Now case in point, case in point as you as the diaspora where you can make the difference. Uh, this summer, and it turns out in 23 years of independence, Ukraine has never had a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. Uh, this summer, we were great. Uh, Jamestown was very fortunate in the fact that we were able, with the help of some people in the diaspora, to be able to bring to the United States the Commander in Chief of the Ukrainian Naval Forces and two sponsor two Ukrainian midshipmen to go for a training cruise on, on board the USS Donald uh, Cook, which is an Aegis class cruise, cruiser. Uh, in England this summer. And what we did with the support of the diaspora was we were able to bypass the corruption, the networks inside the Ministry of Defense, and sponsor, bring to, uh, on this cruise uh, two Ukrainian midshipmen and be able to sponsor, pay for their plane tickets, all within three weeks of getting the go-ahead and the assistance of the U.S. Navy uh, in Kiev that was liaising with Jamestown to try to bring these midshipmen uh, on board this cruise, to give them this invaluable experience. And we were able to do so by bypassing the Ministry of Defense and do going directly by uh, purchasing their plane tickets, sponsoring the, you know, getting their hotels, and, and arranging for them to get this very important three weeks of, of training. Now, this is an example, and thank you. And, and part of this was made for, it was, we're very happy that part of this came from the Ukrainian diaspora uh, in their support uh, in making this all possible. Now, what happened also was we were able to bring to the United States to visit the Commander-in-Chief of the Ukrainian Navy, uh, um, uh, Admiral Ihor uh, uh, Varnchenko. And what happened was in this visit was it able to get American naval uh, strategists and people in the Pentagon focused on the Black Sea and the Ukrainian Navy. This would not have happened without your support. And what we did was getting able people to be focused on this. And I would, I'm very proud to tell you that in part of these efforts in getting this started and bringing them to Washington and meeting with staffers on the Hill uh, and educating those staffers about the Ukrainian naval needs, yesterday uh, there was the announcement uh, on the defense authorization by uh, the, the United States announced that they're giving $350 million in military assistance to uh, Ukraine this year, in, or 2018. And this is a major achievement. But what is more important, Within this language of appropriations, the U.S. provided was the first time the Ukrainian Navy was, as a separate branch of the armed forces, was specifically mentioned in the authorization for assisting the Ukrainian Navy in being able to develop and modernize. And this was uh, assistance, very basic things, mine countermeasures, uh, helping with uh, the Ukrainian Navy with uh, uh, radar detection and things like that. Uh, but this is a very notable achievement, and this all came about because of what happened this summer. So this is just one little tiny aspect of where we got mobilized, we focused, and we were able to, to, to utilize our, ourselves in ways to go around, bypass bureaucracies, and to get people focused and accomplish great things. Now, I only have 10 minutes, so I'll, I'll try to continue to be, be really short here. Uh, but this is a, ma a major achievement where work is not done. Part of the problem, as I mentioned, is that in, as many of you focus and talk about Crimea and the annexation and occupation, it's very critically important to note that the Russians are building uh, what they call the Kerch Strait Bridge. Uh, this bridge is being built and will bypass and will be able to block off the Kerch Straits. Now, anybody who knows the geography of Ukraine knows that there's something called the Sea of Azov. And the Sea of Azov, we know that Mariupol is the gateway, the water gateway uh, to Donbass. If you, can't, if you can't load tankers with steel and export materials from the Sea of Azov and Mariupol, we, uh, Ukraine will be blocked off. And part of the problem was this summer there was something called the Kerch Straits Crisis, where the Russia announced that they were suspending all the maritime transport in the Kerch Straits. It cut it off, and they announced this for 14 days they were suspending any type of traffic. 
Well, we, Jamestown was put out a press release on this. We notified people. The naval people in Kiev were trying to notify, notify policymakers. The Ukrainian National Security Council had a meeting at, uh, discuss, trying to discuss this issue. But unfortunately, August 1st, what happens in Kiev? Everybody's on vacation, okay? <laughs> Two weeks, we tried, and, they, and then we tried to get someone from the presidential office to come down and uh, for, uh, uh, from the presidential apparatus to come in and participate in the meeting. They didn't come. Nobody, in fact, everybody in Kiev at that time was talking about the New York Times article about Ukraine sending uh, rocket engines, exporting engines to North Korea. That was what everybody was worried about. Now, anybody knows, if you look at the naval strategy of the Black Sea, you know that the best way, if the Kerch Strait is blocked off, then you've got a major strategic problem for Ukraine. Now, there was a lot of ideas being floated around at that time in early August. One of them was, hey, let's organize our own flotilla. Let's get those, all those yachts sitting in Odessa and put them to sea. We don't have a navy, but let's put them to sea and let's demonstrate freedom of navigation through the Kerch Strait. That idea went nowhere. Nobody was doing anything. But the ideas and the, were there, and that was really critically important. Now, we've got a very important window now because of the winter is a coming, the curse straight, the construction is going to you know, temporarily cease on and trying to build the bridge. And so we have some time, and we have time in our factor. It is a factor for us now. But unfortunately, sadly, as part of this bureaucratic process, we still have other problems. We have two beautiful uh, Coast Guard cutters called the Island Class Cutter sitting in Baltimore Harbor that Admiral Varnchenko visited this summer. They've been sitting there since July. Uh, they are a free gift from the United States of America to Ukraine. Uh, and in fact, it's like giving somebody a Ferrari, but unfortunately you gave them the keys to the car, but they won't, they didn't, they're not filled up with gas. So the part of the problem here is that the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense has not signed off on these, these Island Class Cutters. They're sitting in Baltimore, uh, and Ukraine will, may lose these cutters uh, uh, if it doesn't put forward the money to transport them uh, to Ukraine. Now, we're talking $30 million vessels built in the late 1980s that are very good, sophisticated, provide radar coverage. They don't come with weaponry, but Ukraine, as you know, has, has a few weapons of its own, and it can equip them. So this is very important, but we're trying to move the bureaucracy in Kiev to sign the agreement, to move them, get the Ukrainian Navy, get these vessels there to them. And so this is very critically important for us right now because we're trying to push that issue. Now going back to the Kerch Straits, there's an important role for Canada to, to play in this. And there's an important role for the United States. As many of you know or may not know, the Kerch Straits and Sea of Azov is a very shallow waterway. So whenever uh, this summer we were talking to the Speaker of Parliament, he was talking about, well, we can send in U.S. warships, we can send them into the Black Sea, and we can, you know, and we can, do, we can show the American flag. Well, part of the problem is that in the Sea of Azov, because it's shallow, you can't send in warships. You need actually something called gunboats, or you need Coast Guard cutters. So the way that you can get around this, and the vision, and this is what the Ukrainian Navy has established, is, is the vision thing. And they have said that, you know, let's talk about freedom of navigation. Coast Guard cutter from Canada and the United States and Britain sh demonstrating freedom of navigation in the Kerch Strait to go and visit. Let's go to Mariupol, let's show the flag and show the Russians that we have freedom of navigation in the Kerch Strait and in the Sea of Azov. So the vision, the ideas are there. And so this is part of the idea of what we're wanting to develop because now I, and I have one minute left here, so I'll try to wrap it up. So, uh, that's, uh, no, I, don't, I want to be fair to all my other, the other panelists. But many of you, you know, we all know what happened in the Crimean War, right? Uh, Crimean War, 1856, right? Well, one of the ways, a lot of the things that policymakers don't understand, did not understand, is the way that the Russians were defeated in the Crimean War. Obviously, we know about the coalition that was built to take, a, uh, Western coalition built to take Crimea, but one of the things... The reason why the Russians were defeated in Crimea was because of one thing. They were starved to death. We cut off the Brits and the French and the Turks, cut off the maritime supply routes to Crimea. Now, we talk about Crimea today. Crimea is ours. But what happened was, and this is a, there's a very important naval footnote in history that we don't know about, which was very, but all the Brits know. There was a gentleman by the name of Admiral Lord Lytton. And Admiral Lord Lytton 
went with the French and he built gunboats and he transported these gunboats into the Sea of Azov. And what he did was during the crime, prior to the defeat of the Russians in Sevastopol, was he cut off all the supply routes to Crimea. He starved the Russians to death in Crimea, which eventually led to their surrender. Now, the modern day lesson for this is Ukraine needs a navy. Ukraine has a vision. It wants to accomplish certain things. And part of that vision now is that it wants to develop what they call the Mosquito Fleet. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen the famous John Wayne movie in harm's way, right? Many people may have heard about that movie, famous movie. Uh, and that's about the PT boats. And you've probably heard about John F. Kennedy uh, and his role as a PT boat commander. Well, the Ukrainian Navy has the idea to create something called the Mosquito Fleet. And part of this program is to develop and acquire fast attack boats. And they want to take these fast attack boats uh, that can reach up to 40 to 50 kilometers per hour on the water, and they want to take these boats and they want to start hitting and being able to develop the capabilities to attack the uh, offshore gas platforms uh, in the Black Sea that the Russians have occupied and which they are modernizing and putting and they're weaponizing now. So the Russians are establishing in the northern part of the Black Sea uh, a, a vast communications network using these offshore gas platforms, which are Ukraine's. And the Navy wants to develop these type of hit and run tactics to where they can try to attack these offshore gas platforms in the same way they're defending their interests in Donbass. And, and so they have established this vision, this idea of creating the Mosquito Fleet. And of course, unfortunately, because in Kiev, it's very dominated by ground forces commanders. So, and, and so if you want to get into NATO, well, you can't get into NATO if, you're, if your Department of the Navy is subordinate to the Ministry of Defense. It has to have a separate branch. In order to have a separate branch, the naval commander currently does not have any decision making on, on, uh, on the acquisition of the, aircraft, of the types of weapons and, and weapon systems uh, that he wants to purchase. And so this is going to, if Ukraine wants to get into NATO, they're going to have to make the Navy a separate branch like it is with other NATO countries. But unfortunately in Ukraine, the Navy is, is like the evil stepchild that nobody wants to talk to, you know. This is, and they're viewed in this way by the ground forces. But it's got to be a, play, a very important role for them to play. And they have to become, uh, they have to get the resource they need. And it's not talking about a lot. Uh, they can use this in a very, very smart way. Now, my last and final point is, is that there's good news, and, there's, and there's, there's very important developments going on. Many of you know Ukrainian geography, know uh, there's a port, port called the uh, Ochakiv uh, on the Black Sea. And the United States right now is installing a long-range uh, radar surveillance system in Ochakiv uh, that is becoming going to give the United States and Ukraine eyes and ears on Crimea and the Black Sea. And the Russians are livid about this uh, radar facility. Uh, they're calling it creation of a U.S. Uh, base on the Black Sea. Now, this is a very important first step that's occurring uh, with the United States and its strategy in, in, inside of Ukraine, and it's hopefully be the, the, the precursor to a greater involvement because the United States doesn't have a Black Sea strategy. They've got to develop this. Ukraine has to work with uh, Romania uh, and uh, other countries and other NATO countries in the Black Sea to develop a vision for uh, developing and, and also securing the Black Sea. And obviously, you know, everybody talks about the land bridge to Crimea. Well, the Russians are building their land bridge through the Kerch Straits, and we have to stop it. And there's something called the Law of the Sea. And unfortunately, uh, people in the Ukrainian government are not, you know, the, the, the Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine uh, was supposed to be looking at this issue on the Kerch Straits, and they're doing nothing. And the United States, I know, when we had a meeting this summer in the White House, uh, we know that a U.S. official said, if Ukraine approaches us, talks to us about it, uh, we'll go to the UN, uh, but there's been no response from Kiev. So we got to get this bureaucracy moving, and we have to make them do things in the right way that help Ukraine develop the national security vision that it wants, and get over this hetmanization of, of Ukrainian society. Uh, and and I think you, as a diaspora, can play that role uh, with your with your resources, your time. Uh, work Canada can work with the United States in, in, in this type of in developing these strategic issues and I think it's a very important thing that for us to keep this in mind as we move forward. A very tiny part of what Ukraine is doing in terms of its national security and modernization of its, great, of its ground forces but hey my view is Ukraine is a nation of 45 million so 
This is a country that's got resources, it's got a defense industrial complex. It has lots of potential. But the problem is, is the resources are not putting, being put in the right way to develop Ukraine and develop its own national security and to meet its own interests in, in, a, in, a, new, in a new world and in, in, in a society that's trying to get rid of the Russian occupation of Donbass. So thank you very much for letting me speak today. Great. Uh, <laughs>